How's it going, friends? Today, I'm going to tell you why the <clears throat> I'm on YouTube. So I've got three kids, I work a full-time job, but I've chosen to come down this path of starting a YouTube channel. Now to explain this whole thing to you, I'm going to have to start by telling you where I come from, where I'm at right now, and where I plan on going with this channel. For the next however many minutes, I'm asking you to come with me on an adventure. I'm going to be Gandalf, you're going to be my Bilbo Baggins, and we are going to head off to slay a dragon. I'm not sure where the dwarves are right now, they're probably passed out in a corner somewhere but they'll, they'll be there so don't worry we're gonna be great it's gonna be a good time all right so where i come from well i was a kid and like most kids you spend a lot of time you know trying to figure things out maybe think about uh what you want to be when you grow up i decided that i wanted to either be an astronaut a trapeze artist or a animator now i climbed a lot of trees i fell out of a lot of trees so trapeze artist seemed a little shaky um, astronaut, well, you know, I tried mixing the chemicals in my parents' basement to build something explosive enough to launch me into space without very much success. And artist, well, that was easy enough and relatively safe, right? All I had to do is draw pictures, and that is what I did a lot. I drew a lot of pictures and made up a lot of things and used a lot of paper. School was never a thing I enjoyed. Now, the teachers didn't care for my behavior. I tend to like to daydream and doodle in the edges of the papers. I loved art classes. I never really fit in at school. And when you don't fit in somewhere, you start to get beat down by that. You have people telling you that, you know, this is the measure of success. And if you're not measuring up, then you feel like a failure. So I ended up leaving school. All right, I was about to just give you like the worst segue ever. So I figured I better record this real quick. I didn't leave school entirely because I didn't like school. I ended up leaving school because I had a lot of trouble catching up with my classes because of, well, this thing that happened in the next bit of the story right here. So my friend is driving and we're cruising down this road in Western Pennsylvania. And it was the winter time and it just snowed and you had gunk on the windshield and the whole nine yards. Uh, we hit this patch of ice and the car spun around and thankfully didn't hit anything just kind of came to rest there so there we are parked and i'm thinking all right let's just hop out of here and see what's going on and i look out my passenger side window and i see this uh, old blue station wagon coming right at us now unfortunately the ice was uh, in both lanes and so the car didn't stop and a moment later I found myself with my legs in the front passenger seat and my body in the back seat. Not that I was severed, I was just bent really weird. And uh, so I'm laying there uh, looking at the items on the floor behind the driver's seat and I found this Iron Man figure I had brought with me and uh, the force of the impact had actually knocked its head clean off. And so as I sat there staring at this thing I thought, well that's it, I mean I'm not going to be an astronaut or trapeze artist or animator when I grow up because this is the end for me. And I guess I felt kind of okay with that. And then I just kind of blacked out. So the next thing I remember is I'm waking up and I'm screaming my head off. I'm on this uh, surgical steel table and this doctor is just going at me with this uh, scrub brush. And my mother is freaking out, you know, screaming at all the nurses and anybody who will listen, you know, to get me some painkillers. You know, my body is like, my leg is convulsing and I end up passing out again. The next real memory I have is just waking up in a hospital bed. It turns out my right hip from the impact had been smashed up really good and it took 24 pins and uh, 12 plates to patch the whole thing together. And I ended up with this really cool scar that looks like a big Y on my right hip. I used to make fun of it and say, you know, like, why did this happen to me, you know? So I spent a couple months in the hospital. I ate crappy food. I had this really cool button that delivered nice little doses of morphine. And uh, my leg was in sort of this, uh, this device that would just, you know, move my leg back and forth. Uh, to keep the muscles active while I lay there. Then they told me that I wouldn't be able to run. It was very unlikely I'd be able to run again. And I thought, well, that's crap. I love to run. What are you supposed to do when your enemies come chasing you? So I didn't accept that, you know. And from that day on, every evening, as I was laying in bed, I would do, like, these leg lifts. It just hurt so bad. 
And you know, I started out on crutches and after a while I moved on to a cane. Eventually I was able to ditch the cane. Uh, I wasn't quite running yet, but I was walking pretty good. When I was about 19 or 20, I moved with a bunch of friends to this great city of Cincinnati, Ohio. And we all lived in a great big house there. So one evening my friend comes home and he's got this stunned look on his face like he'd just seen a ghost. And uh, we're like, dude, what's up? And he's like, man, I just got robbed at gunpoint while working at the 7-Eleven. Like, what? Are you kidding me? Are you okay? Like, how do you feel, man? Uh, and he was, he was cool. It was alright. He made it out alive, so everything was good. It turns out that the person sent to investigate the crime was the Cincinnati Chief of Police. It turns out the chief was studying the art of Taijitsu from this guy, Stephen Hayes. And for those who don't know, I mean, this is apparently like the ninja art, right? This is where it came from, Taijutsu. But these people were, are hardcore. I mean, they used everything. Their martial way is to use whatever is available to defend themselves. Basically, we ended up uh, going with the chief to take a class. We're all set up to take this class, and I'm partnered up with this woman. I must have been, you know, in her early 20s as well, and she just looks at me, and she's like, you know, come at me. <laughs> what? Come at you? Oh, okay, you know. So I didn't know anything. Really, I took this, you know, this punch at her. A moment later, she's got me all twisted up like a pretzel on the ground. It's that moment, actually, that I'm like, yeah, I need to learn this. And thus became uh, a lifelong uh, passion uh, for the martial arts. So I practiced. Uh, I practiced a lot. And after a few months, it turns out that not only could I run again, I was able to throw some, you know, some pretty high kicks. So the martial arts changed my life in many different ways. Uh, that, that experience really had a profound effect on me. And it gave me this missing component. It gave me self-esteem again. It gave me courage. So what I got from the car wreck was this, that realization that life is incredibly fickle and it's, it's so short and it just at any moment it can end or it could go terribly wrong. And so you really have to take each moment and just really embrace it. And so those two things in hand, I was thrust into my next adventure. So now I'm 20 years old. I've got my courage back. I've got my ability to run back. And I have this whole new vision of what is possible in life. And uh, my friends decided we should take a road trip. Not just any road trip, mind you. We were going to take a road trip that was a giant circle around the entirety of the United States of America and on that trip we were going to see as many national parks as we possibly could. So, one of the nice things that came out of getting in an accident, fortuitously enough, was some insurance money. And I took some of that money and I purchased an old Toyota van. We loaded up the van with what we had and a bunch of people and we headed east. We drove to Philly, met, met a friend there, drove to Ocean City, met another friend, uh, headed down south through all the wonderful southern states, Georgia, ended up in New Orleans, and then cut across the top of Texas, stayed with a friend in Houston, and New Mexico, Arizona, into California. We drove through LA right at rush hours, fantastically hair-raising adventure, and then we headed up north uh, using a little bit of Route 1 and then Route 5 until we arrived at one of the most beautiful cities I've ever seen in my life. Uh, that evening we rolled into San Francisco and the place was just alive with color and lights and texture and people were partying on the roof and walking through the streets and laughing and, and there were weirdos, there were, there were weirdos everywhere. I was like, this is, this is it, I finally found my home. This is where all the, the weirdos are. Uh, so we, you know, keep on rolling through San Francisco, head down to the coast and park the car uh, right there on the beach and just pass out. Next morning we wake up and there's this dude standing there, California dude, right? And he looks at us and he's like, hey, what's up? Uh, where are you from? We told him, well, you know, we're from Pittsburgh. And we're driving a big circle around the country. And he's like, whoa, man, that's awesome, you know? And so this dude, he's got uh, this truck with kind of this camper trailer thing attached to it. And he's like, hey, listen, man, I got I got eggs in there. There's a stove, fridge, just help yourself, whatever you want. Make yourself some breakfast. And we totally did because we were poor and starving and driving across the country. Just like an amazing experience, right? We I drove the whole way across the country, ended up 
uh, in this strange place and woke up to find this just perfectly beautiful human being who was willing to share his food with us. So after that we headed north, uh, you know, saw the weird deer of Northern California into Portland. Uh, I think we hit Washington. I don't, I don't remember if we made it all the way to Seattle because we were running out of money and time. And then we just cut across the top of the country, uh, taking mostly Route 80 uh, to get us back home. So when I got home, I realized, man, I, I got to leave this place. I, I need to be there. I need to go back west. And I loaded up my car, and I got my cat, Etrius, as my co-pilot, and I headed out for California. And so the whole plan was that if you go to California and you get residency, then community college is practically free. And so I got all my basic credits out of the way there. And I, I studied philosophy and I studied, uh, you know, a little bit of biology and I took a whole lot of art classes. And that's when it came back to me, you know, like, wow, I actually like to learn things on my own terms. And I love art. I, I wanted to be an animator, right? So I finished up my base credits and I got myself into the Academy of Art University in San Francisco where I received a BFA in Fine Art and VFX. And the Academy was just this wonderful place too, man. I mean, I spent every day in San Francisco and all the school buildings were just spread out all over the place, like, you know, Pier 39 or right there in the financial district. And so your school day was basically wandering around the city to these cool old buildings and, you know, taking art classes and people from Pixar there and Disney there and Aardman and just, it was just a fantastic experience. So my first job took me to LA and I ended up working for this guy and his name was Eddie Paul. Now, Eddie Paul was a stuntman and you probably, if you've ever seen the movie Ice Pirates, he is in there as he's on top of this big wheeled skull buggy thing and he's going to punch the hero and the hero blocks him or punches him or something and he goes, oof! It was a huge role. Should have got some kind of Academy Award. But the coolest thing about Eddie is uh, not only was he a stuntman, he was the guy who built those vehicles. He built the big skull thing with the with the giant wheels. Uh, he did the cars for the Fast and the Furious, Triple uh, X, and my first day there, I actually showed up kind of late in the evening. I had just gotten to LA, and I walk in the shop, and he's got this tricked out little you know car sitting in there. And he's like, hey, come help me, you know, put decals on this thing. He was making uh, cars for the second or third Fast and the Furious movie. And he was uh, doing them all up and it was this cool, like, cyber pattern or something. Uh, while there, I mean, we worked on the real-life Pixar cars. I helped make a replica of the Akira motorcycle for a Kanye West music video. Uh, let's see, I designed the uh, dive helmet for Team Cousteau. It's like this hammerhead shark thing, you know. And while I was there, basically what I did is I operated the boom arm cameras, I did editing, I set up his websites, uh, I made 3D models for, for printing. You know, we had this, um, this router that would cut a block of wood into whatever, uh, whatever the model was that you sent it. And then we'd take vacuum forming, we'd basically superheat plastic and uh, use this vacuum and it would suck the plastic down around the model. So that's how we made like all the parts of Sally and uh, Lightning McQueen. And I also even got to drive the Goodyear blimp while I was there. Uh, we, you know, he, Eddie asked me one day, he's like, you want to go on the Goodyear blimp with Jay Leno? And I'm like, okay, yeah, that sounds, that sounds cool. Unfortunately, Jay couldn't make it, but uh, Jay is real big into cars, right? And he has his own test driver. So his test driver actually ended up coming with us. And at one point, uh, the pilot, you know, he's just cruising along. We're in this blimp wearing these headphones so we can hear each other talk and everything. And the driver just gets up from his seat and he turns around and looks at us. He's like, who wants to drive? Of course, we're like, oh, yeah, heck yeah, man. So we all took turns, you know, you get in this thing. And it just had two pedals and like this stick. And like the pedals would make it go up and down, I think. And the stick was like left and right. And he literally could not wreck it, you know. So we all took turns uh, flying the Goodyear blimp over Long Beach. So unfortunately, I had to leave Eddie's. It was really cool, man, working there. Uh, but I was trying to start a family. And uh, there was no insurance, you know, health insurance or anything like that involved. And a friend of mine at the time gave me a call and was like, hey, man, um, we're hiring a technical animator to work at Sega. We're going to do some stuff. You want to you want to come up here? I'm like, technical animator. I mean, I studied to be an animator, but yeah, all right. I mean, whatever, you know. So for those of you who don't know what technical animation or character rigging is, uh, I have a video 
uh, here I'll put like an info bar or something right there so you can uh, check that out if you're interested and uh, that's what I did I worked on Golden Axe I uh, worked on some Iron Man games uh, none of them really actually did very well and I ended up getting laid off uh, after about a year and a half so I left part of the story out I ended up being married at this time to a woman who was with me through this entire California adventure and I told her Listen, once I get a real job and I've got health insurance and the 401k, we'll have a kid. And we did. We had a kid. And then I got uh, laid off. So I came home, you know, totally looking down. I'm like, man, this sucks. And I said to her, hey, this is stressful, man. We got a kid and we have no family. Do you want to go back east? And she's like, heck yeah, I want to go back east. So, you know, I got on the phone. I talked to some different people. And I ended up getting a job uh, with this game company called Turbine and they made uh, the Lord of the Rings online Dungeons and Dragons online so I was a senior technical animator there for uh, several years and still wanting to get a little bit closer to home I ended up taking a job at Vicarious Visions in Albany so I did all the character rigging for uh, Skylanders Swap Force and then I moved on to build the rigging tools and uh, do a lot of the gameplay rigging for uh, Skylanders superchargers and then I went on to do uh, the cinematics rigging and tools for uh, uh, Skylanders Imaginators and I got to work um, on a little bit of Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. Then another thing happened uh, I got in touch with one of my old producers who was working down here at Firaxis in Maryland and they needed somebody and Firaxis is only four hours away from our family so I made one more jump and here I am now and I'm working on uh, XCOM uh, Civilization and a few other projects that I would tell you about but I would have to kill you if I did alright so that's got us caught up now the question is where am I going Hopefully you're not bored yet. I mean, don't click that stop button. Just stay here for a second because I'm about to get really, really honest with you. Because before I tell you where I'm going, I think I need to tell you why I'm going there. Let's start with the idea of belief. I don't like belief. I know Steve Jobs would have said, uh, if I want to get an audience, then find your belief and share that belief with the world. And everyone who shares that belief will will flock to you well i guess my belief is that i don't like belief i think we're already at a disadvantage as human beings right we live in a vast universe and the only way we have to perceive it are these senses our eyes ears nose taste feeling on our skin and so we're already not really seeing the truth right and then we take something our brain concocts and we create a lens through which to see the universe did you see my face right now and i put a little pinhole in front of it right and that's belief, at least my understanding of it. All right, just a disclaimer. Take everything this guy is saying with a grain of salt. He tends to get a little overly philosophical at times. But here's the thing about belief. There's nothing wrong with them. In fact, as human beings, if we didn't parse our reality up into manageable chunks, I, I don't know how we'd manage. Now, if I had to pick two beliefs, I would go with this, is that we're all connected. Everything is connected. We're all one. The same atomic structure, or the same atoms that make up my body, uh, are the same atoms that make up the sun, that flow throughout the entire universe. Breath that comes out of my mouth, it feeds the trees and the lawn, and you know, the clovers in the lawn feed the bunnies, and the bunnies die, and it's just all one big cyclical thing. But we're all together. So the second belief I would take on, cooperation supersedes competition when it comes to the survival of our species. This funny thing happened in the 1980s. This movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, they took this idea, the idea of survival of the fittest, and they transposed that into this concept that it was you against the world, and that your measure of success was the amount of wealth or personal gain you'd accumulated before you died. Now, this is not actually what Darwin means by survival of the fittest. All right, let's just check the Wikipedia here. Yeah. So, survival of the fittest is a phrase that originated from Darwinian evolution theory as a way of describing the mechanism of natural selection. The biological concept of fitness is defined as reproductive success. 
In Darwinian terms, the phrase is best understood as survival of the form that will leave the most copies of itself in successive generations. Now we can go on to here, and it looks like uh, Herbert Spencer was the one who first started applying it to economics. And, uh, well, there's definitely a lot of mention of race. Maybe this is kind of where a lot of racial tension is justified. But it does say preservation of favored races. So, I mean, the human race, right? Let's look at humanity. Uh, our environment being planet Earth. You know, humanity is a species. And so far, competition, well, it's not looking like a great way to survive. I mean, if you read the headlines, it's, you know, World War III. It's uh, the environment is collapsing. Uh, uh, all these things are happening, and this is the legacy, you know, we're leaving to the next generation. But I am an optimist, and I see this thing happening. And where we're heading is more in the direction of being conscious, of being compassionate, of realizing that we have this powerful tool and that all this bickering on this planet over resources uh, no longer serves us. We need to be like bacteria. A single bacteria, relatively harmless. You get two bacteria together though and they, f they create a form that can kill you dead. And that's what we need to be as human beings. We need to be bacteria that uh, spread throughout the galaxy like a, like a disease. Ego was this survival trait that allowed us to survive in our environment as a species. It's that part of you that keeps you out of harm's way, that gives you self-realization uh, so that you realize you're a living organism and you don't want to die. But ego can be twisted. It can make you think that you're in danger uh, when you're actually not in danger. And it can actually put you in danger when you shouldn't have been in danger in the first place. Certain human beings, I like to think them as sociopaths, started collecting stuff, you know, to fulfill this ego. They had to have the power and the control and the stuff. And uh, this never stopped. And capitalism provided like a fertile grounds for the breeding of ego. And just like the Wolf of Wall Street, it became everybody for themselves. So there are individuals on this planet who literally do pretty much run the show, right? They don't end up in the Forbes 500 because they're in a whole different class. We wanted stuff, we wanted security, we wanted whatever, you know, came with this system. And it's not even to say that this system is bad. In fact, I think that it's really great that we ended up here because of these systems, this focus of resource and power uh, we were able to accomplish enormous things. And it even led to this opportunity to, that I have right now. Uh, the fact that we can communicate with, ch with each other instantaneously, that we have devices that fit in our pockets that let us access like all of the world's information. It's absolutely amazing. And I don't think without all that stuff that came before, we would have ended up here, you know? It's to say that uh, what happens, happens for a reason. But here we are now. We have access to all that information. We have the ability to communicate. We have the ability to form like a true democracy through direct communication. Now, as an artist, this presents a lot of possibilities. Now, historically, artists were patronized. The cool thing now is that anybody can be a patron. You can actually pursue your own vision. Many is greater than one, right? If you put all the decision-making in the hands of one person or one small group of people, you're not going to get the best possible decision. But if you crowdsource that, if you let everyone come up with ideas, and if the best ideas just sort of float to the top, then, then that's what you get. You get you get the very best. The cream of the crop. It rise to the top. I'm sorry. I think the world's in trouble, but I think we are at the greatest moment in human history. You know, there's this thing called the Bodhisattva vow. Just as all the previous Suguttas, the Buddhas generated the mind of enlightenment and accomplished all the stages of the Bodhisattva training, so will I too, for the sake of all beings, generate the mind of enlightenment and accomplish all the stages of the Bodhisattva training. They're basically saying they're going to become enlightened and then they're going to come and make sure that everybody else also becomes enlightened. I mean, whatever enlightened means. And I think that's what I wanted to do here, and that's why I've been struggling so much with what I have been doing is that there's this message and there's this urgency that I want to express to everybody and I've been looking for the medium by which to do that and above and beyond that I want to empower all of you watching this to express your own ideas because that is what we need right now we need a lot of good original 
ideas just constantly flowing. And if you're watching this, you're probably an artist or you're a storyteller. I mean, the one thing is for sure though, if you're still watching this video after 20 minutes or whatever, that hopefully um, our beliefs align. All right, that's really enough of this. I think we could go on and on and I would love to just sit here and philosophize uh, for hours. So what does this really mean? What am I going to do on this YouTube channel? I mean, you've probably been waiting several, like 20 minutes or more just to find out. And I appreciate your patience. We're going to make a story. We're going to bring a story to life. My brother came to me with this idea. This is the idea that helped me get to sleep that night when I couldn't find direction. And that was this sort of... Whoa, wait a, wait a second. I can't actually tell them what the idea is. That'll spoil all the fun. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to cut that out. After mulling it over in my brain for a while, looking at like what I have already been doing, trying to find sort of a solution for storytelling that you know allowed a single individual to quickly tell a large, compelling story. I think it's a really good story, and I think it's just in time. I think you're gonna like it. I really do. So here's the deal. I'm gonna tell you that story, but I don't want to just sit here on my own ego and go around telling the ultimate stories, you know. I want you to be able to tell stories too. We need an army of artists. And it's gonna be dangerous and it's gonna be a little scary. Yeah, I don't think it's actually gonna be scary. I mean, unless you're counting like the threat of carpal tunnel or something. I don't really even know exactly what I'm doing, but we're gonna figure this out together. I'm gonna show you everything I do. I'm gonna I'll let you listen in on the conversations I have where we're figuring out the story. I'm gonna show you the storyboards. I'm, you know, I'm gonna try to make music and sound effects and I'm gonna take you with me on every step of this. The editing, everything, I mean just everything. And eventually uh, we were thinking it would be kind of cool to bring this into sort of a live format, right? So we could take this on Twitch and we could set it up. We might even set it up like with rules, like a role playing game, right? Because I just love this idea of crowdsourcing. I mean, you all have brilliant ideas. All right. Oh, it's getting late. Uh, let me just wrap this up. I don't have it all formed yet, right? But I'm pretty sure it's going to be cool. I have a Patreon thing, which is there. It's not really set up very well yet. But more importantly, I want, I want to get on Twitch and I want to do those live streams. I'm really just thinking of all kinds of cool ways that we can start interacting. Uh, for instance, if you want, you can come and visit the Facebook group I have set up. I'll put a link down below. And in there, we're doing like um, user-generated stories, right? Like I, I say a sentence, you say a sentence, somebody else says a sentence, and we get a story out of that. Or we're doing drawing um, sort of exercises where it's like, hey, draw a duck wearing a tuxedo or a robot duck wearing a tuxedo and a bow tie, right? And so drop in on those. And I'm thinking of even moving something like that over to Reddit. All right, that is about all I can do tonight. I am really tired, but I super appreciate you spending all this time with me. If you like what you saw, hit the subscribe button. Just start a conversation in the comments below, and hopefully I'm gonna see you again real soon.